I'm Bart van Aerik, I'm Chief Economist at the Conference Board and I'm honoured to deliver the annual Price Lecture on Productivity. The title of this lecture is Are We Missing the Productivity Revival Again? Which is a little bit provocative, but really getting at the question why it is that all the new technologies and digital transformations that are happening in our economy are not yet translating into productivity growth. Good evening, welcome to the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. I'm Jagjit Chadha, the Director um, of the National Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening. The Institute is running its first ever Festival of Social Science, with many thanks to the Economic and Social Research Council for funding us um, to run this particular um, festival this week. It's been an interesting period to be a social scientist. It's been an interesting period to be an economist. I came to the Institute, um, as every schoolboy and girl now knows, uh, in uh, May 2016, a few weeks before the uh, referendum. And I don't think I've sat down much since, as indeed no one else has at the Institute. Um, we pride ourselves on getting our analysis uh, right and explaining how the frontiers of research can influence and set, and ought to set, the policy agenda. And I'm proud of the work that we've done as an Institute and my colleagues have been doing over the past three and a half years. Um, but this event also allows us as an institute to celebrate much of what we've done in the past. The efforts of previous researchers here at the institute are ones from which we all benefit today um, because we're able to build upon the work that they did. And it's a particular pleasure with the ESRC's funding to be able to establish a new annual lecture at the institute, the Sig Price Lecture in Productivity. Sig, to those of you who knew, know him, and I'm tremendously grateful for the support of his family here this evening, uh, pioneered much of the work on understanding productivity um, in the UK. Um, not only at work at the factory level, at the establishment level, but also at what is now fashionable at the microeconomical school or firm um, level as well, and as well at the level of the household. Famously, he once uh, quit a government inquiry because he wasn't happy about the conclusions in terms of numeracy in schools. This was, would you believe, over 30 years ago. And it's an issue that still is something we haven't addressed properly in this country. And I think that's a great co um, co condemnation of the political leaders that we've had. In fact, we don't need very much to condemn them, do we, at the moment? Uh, aren't we lucky to have the leaders uh, that we have? I'm not going to um, say much more about Say, I'll leave, I think, Bart, who worked with him here at the Institute for a couple of years, to say a, a little bit more. Uh, and after the lecture, I'm very pleased to say Judith um, Price will give a vote of thanks um, to Bart, but also let me also give a vote of thanks to her for the great support she's given us and to her family for allowing us to put this lecture on today. There's much talk in this country about prosperity, well-being, um, sense of nationhood and whether people have been left behind or not. Let me be absolutely clear, the issues that Sig worked on in his career, which are about productivity, are the crucible of prosperity. They're the crucible because it's with households and regions at firms across the country, if they are able to meet their productive potential, we will all feel better off together. And these are the issues that we have to address as a country before any other. They are very much the things that cause us not to feel uh, as happy as we might otherwise about circumstances in the country. So I'd like to turn to Bart Van Ark, who is a great friend of the Institute. He worked here in the late 1980s before going off to Groningen. Uh, where he built his academic career, got a chair and then moved to the conference board uh, in New York in 2008 and immediately, immediately caused the financial crisis on his arrival. Um, <laughs> but he's been there mopping up the aftermath in the last uh, 11 or so years and I'm absolutely delighted and thrilled that he's made time. He, if you think you're busy, you should look at his schedule. It's absolutely enormous. I want to thank him very much for making time to come along to us today to talk about productivity um, so I give you, without further ado, Bart Van Ark. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jagjit. And um, well, I may have gotten the financial crisis done by going to the US. The, one, the question is whether I'll get Brexit done by being here today. I mean, that's, uh, but that's for another occasion. Uh, th thank you so much for uh, the invitation. And I'm, I have to say, I'm deeply, deeply honored uh, to be the first one uh, to deliver uh, a lecture in honor of uh, Sig Price. 
uh, I wonder what he would think if he knew I would be the first. <laughs> um, he probably would have smiled and then shaken his head, whatever, but, uh, but at least I, I'm deeply honored that I, I got this opportunity. And I really uh, wanted to start by uh, paying a personal tribute to him um, uh, because he's been critical to my own professional development. As, as Jackie said, I was here from 1988 to 1990. It was my, in a way, my first real job coming out of, uh, coming out of my PhD. Um, and coming out of an environment where I was trained on macroeconomic growth, I suddenly arrived here at the National Institute, worked for a person uh, who had just an incredible eye for detail, um, for being precise, for not liking any kind of average. Everything had to be absolutely precise. Um, and perhaps at that time I didn't fully appreciate how important that was, but it was only later on in my career when I realized, for example, that there's no silver bullet for productivity growth, which I will talk about a bit uh, today, that I really began to appreciate how important uh, that was. I took a few quotes from a, a great obituary that Heather Rolf has done uh, last year uh, here at the National Institute, and I just took a few quotes directly from her because they're so well phrased. First of all, uh, Sig, of course, has a, had a background in his own family business, and I do remember that at the time that we were doing these best plants comparisons, Jeff Mason is here, he actually forced me to do one on the biscuit industry because my family was out of the biscuit industry. So he said, you've got to go to the look at the businesses where your roots are. So we did a biscuit uh, 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 comparison to the great dismay of Jeff, I guess, and I remember that one day we did actually quality comparisons of biscuits right here at Friday Tea. <laughs> And we were having a table here with biscuits from Germany, the UK, and the Netherlands, and we were doing testing which ones were the best. I won't discuss the results of that today, but I do think it was very important. Now, Sig reminded me a little bit of Sherlock Holmes, I realized later. When Sherlock Holmes was talking about chasing Watson, he, he would say, and I quote, how often have I said that when you have excluded the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And that was a little bit sick. He would go for all the possible explanations, and then the ones that he ended up with, of course, was the importance of intermediate qualifications and particular vocational training, which has been quoted here, and the great importance of doing a very detailed cross-country comparisons that I already referred to earlier. And I, I do think that is of great importance. And after that, when I went back to Groningen and started to work with Angus Madison, working on global GDP measures back to the year zero, I sometimes had to remind myself how important it was to get grounded uh, in, in the real work that he's doing. So again, I'm very honored uh, to have this opportunity. The title of my uh, talk today would not have pleased him, I guess, because, you know, what is the ground for this? And to some extent, I've used this title once or twice more often, basically to provoke a little bit and get people to come, like, you know, is there something we didn't know or we didn't see? And there is some truth to that, although I have to say that a year ago, and some of you were there, I did a talk at Harvard with the same title, where my argument was that actually we may begin to see something of a productivity recovery. It's just that we are not seeing it happening. And one of the reasons for that is that we're just not measuring it very well. But another reason for that is that productivity usually does not come with a big bang, but it comes gradually when it works its way through the economy uh, in different sectors, in different industries, in different firms. And it's only when it starts to diffuse very widely across the economy that we're beginning to pick it up in the macroeconomic numbers. Now, this was more than a year ago, a year and a half ago, that I had that talk. And I have to admit, even today, when I, and I'll show you the numbers a little later, when I look at the US productivity growth numbers, well, they're up a little bit from what they were but I think it would be premature to, to say that, uh, that there has been the structural recovery uh, uh, already. But the other way to think about this, of course, is that maybe the productivity recovery is not there, and if we're not careful, we will miss the opportunity for productivity growth once again. And that, I think, is actually my main point today, that because when I look at what's going on in the economy, in particular working for a business research think tank, and I see what is going on in businesses in terms of innovation, in terms of digital transformation, it is actually another puzzle, another productivity puzzle that we're dealing with, and that's why are we not yet seeing that in the bottom line results? And, and what is it that we are missing in this respect? So I will spend uh, uh, quite a bit of time about that uh, today. So I'll spend some time about the diagnosis, and I'll focus myself a little bit on the last 10 years, exactly since the mid-2000s. So There's great work written by many of you in the rooms. So actually, I read some of it again uh, in preparing for this for the period before then. Uh, but I really, given the time, want to focus a little bit over the, on, on the last 10 years, talk a little bit about some of the macro drivers uh, of growth, talking a little bit about the sectoral uh, changes really going into this digital transformation, 
and perhaps then go to the micro level in six on and talk a little bit about the issue of skills uh, and, and uh, particular intermediate skills. There are a few things in gray there, simply not because they're not important, simply because in the 40 minutes that I have, I just can't impossibly deal with all of those. But measurement obviously is critical in tribute to the National Institute, ESCO and Rebecca, Riley in particular for all the work around measurement that is being done in this space. It's of critical importance and I do think it will help. I will actually show you in a minute that I think one reason that measurement helps is that we probably have a better picture in the UK what is going on than in some other countries. I think there's really been progress made here. I would love to talk about fiscal and monetary policy in the last 10 years and that, what that has done to productivity. I have no time for that, but maybe we can get into it in the questions. I would love to talk about all the great work around reallocation and dispersion. That's not my work, but it's very, very important. Uh, and, and also the role of management. But I would like to save a little bit of time towards the end to stick out my neck and actually do something, talk a little bit about the future and what might happen in the area of productivity. And I built, but, uh, based myself partly on the work that we are doing uh, at the conference board in terms of actually projecting growth out for 10 years. Now projecting productivity is an important part of that. It's an incredibly tricky and messy thing to do. But I think there are some insights that at least give us a ground for discussion and perhaps talk a little bit about some of the policy implications. But then, of course, have enough time to uh, discuss this with you. So let me start with uh, the diagnosis. And I really don't want to start on the UK. I want to start on the global part of productivity growth. Because frankly, we have to really realize that this productivity slowdown thing, we all know that, but it's, not, it's important to remind ourselves, is really a global phenomenon. This comes from our Conference Board Total Economy Database. This has 120 countries in it. We aggregated everything up. And you can see how labor productivity growth basically since the mid-2000s has slowed down. Now, don't make too much of those straight lines. They're not scientific. You can do this in 10 different ways. But I think there's pretty big consensus that the slowdown in productivity has happened since the mid-2000s. Importantly, it happened before the financial crisis. It happened before I left from the Netherlands to the US. Uh, we've basically been seeing this since the mid-2000s. And it basically has continued since. Of course, we had the crisis, a big recovery after that. But since then, that ongoing slowdown has been happening globally. Indeed, when we take sort of a, a HP uh, filter and we smooth this out over time, don't look too much at the left end. But you can basically see that this slowdown has happened everywhere. But very importantly, and that is important to f uh, not to forget, a lot of the slowdown in global productivity growth actually happened in emerging markets. And it particularly, of course, happened in China. <laughs> A lot of what we're seeing at a global level simply has to do with the fact that productivity growth rates in China have dropped off to, well, very low or perhaps, an, according to some estimates, even negative uh, in the last uh, couple of years. That's not the topic of today, but I think it is important to realize uh, the slowdown in the U.S. and in other mature economies, which of course includes the U.K., happened since the 2000s and then basically stabilized. I, it's not that we are seeing every year even more of a productivity slowdown for the simple reason, as I will show in a minute, that it can't really go much lower because we're facing uh, zero or negative total factor productivity growth rates. And that means that you can't really have negative total factor growth rates for very long. Uh, but I, I, you know, it's a global phenomenon and it's been uh, widespread. So what has caused this? Now, we could spend a whole hour just on this. We're not going to do this. Uh, I already mentioned the elephant in the room, which is emerging markets. That is an important part of it. And don't forget that if something happens in China, it happens to everyone because pretty much everyone is exposed. Uh, just look at what has been happening in this global slowdown in the last few years. There's been a lot of debate to the role of the global financial crisis. Uh, I think the consensus is, and I refer to work, for example, by John Vernald, uh, that you know, the global financial crisis didn't cause it, but it didn't make it easier to resolve it, of course. Uh, there's this whole issue around secular stagnation with slow demand, weak investment, low interest rates, too low interest rates probably, uh, in, in some people's minds in terms of the reallocation issues it can create as well as failing fiscal policy to really uh, uh, get a focus of fiscal policy towards its productivity story. Another story that's been told a lot and working for a business research think tank, I see it all, I see that mentioned all the time, is the rise in regulation. It's always regulation that is the cause of the problem. And again, not a topic that we can discuss very extensively today, but a lot of the research suggests, well, there isn't really a very strong case to be made. Regulation is something of all times. 
regulation is a typically U-shaped effect, so it, you know, of course it has negative effects uh, for a while. Sorry, it, has, it can help for a while, and then at some point it moves the other direction. Um, and certainly in the last couple of years, there isn't a lot of signs that the, the regulatory burden has hugely increased. So it's a tricky, tricky explanation, it, certainly when you want to explain the slowdown of productivity in the last 10 years. My focus today is very much on what I call the productivity paradox of the new digital economy. And I'll explain these terms in a little a bit of what the new digital economy is exactly about, but the point really is that the rapid pace of digitization in the last 10 years has very rapidly diffused, but is quite often confused with absorbed. Diffused means that everybody's touched by digital technology, that's true for all of us personally, it's true for most businesses, but when it comes to the question whether we're successfully absorbing this as businesses and drive our business models and bottom line by this, the results, the jury is out on, on, on the results and it is highly, highly dispersed when we look at studies done by the OECD and again studies here in the UK that show that some countries are benefiting from this digitization in terms of bottom line productivity growth and others don't. A very important element why this is happening, and it comes again from a lot of research but also a lot of work that we are doing with our own business members at the conference board, is that this is a really difficult technology for businesses to implement. This is a great example, and there are not many technologies where consumers are faster in adopting the technology than businesses implementing it in their own processes. We had our smartphones and tablets very quickly. We qu immediately understood what we could do with it, good and bad. We could do, uh, do so all sorts of things with it. But for businesses, it really fundamentally changes their business model and the way they're organizing themselves. And very importantly, it changes the skills and competencies of those in the workforce to make this technology work. So that's basically the bottom line of what I'm saying. Again, there's no silver bullet to the productivity problem or the solution, but I do think that the focus on making new <coughs> digital technology and making the new digital economy work is very important. And if we don't do it right, we will indeed miss that productivity recovery that we're hoping for. That was the reason of the title for my talk today. Now let's now zoom in a little bit on uh, uh, the UK in a, in a comparative way. And what I decided to do is to basically focus just on three other countries in most of what I'm going to discuss today, because otherwise it's just too many countries on, and you lose track. It's already uh, not, diffi not difficult to lose track in, in just looking at four of those countries. But of course I will compare with the US, I will compare, at, uh, compare with the Netherlands, not to betray my own roots, and I will compare with Germany because we have this tendency to continuously think of Germany as the, the Wirtschaftswunder and, and the great success in the European case, which is true to some extent, but as we will see in some other extents, absolutely not. So these are really three interesting countries to, to look at. As I said, I'll focus a little bit on the last 20 years, something on the last 10 years, but what you can see here, and this is now well established, is that not only is the UK productivity level, this is labor productivity lower, that we already knew, but also the gap widened again. Uh, after some catching up that happened between 1995 and 2007, it widened again uh, compared to all those three countries and the rest of Europe, frankly, uh, since approximately 2005. So what is the underlying uh, uh, reason for this? This is a complex chart. I'm going to explain it because I will use this kind of chart more often. Those of you who do growth accounting will recognize it, of course, but also think about what do these terms mean because we sometimes change the terms a little because I sometimes present those charts for business audiences and when I talk to them about all sorts of complex growth accounting terms, I will lose them. So we've used some, some other terminology here. So on the left-hand side, you're looking at GDP growth average on three time periods up to 2007, the crisis 2011 to 12 roughly, and then to 13 to 18. And then the contributions are essentially divided into two parts. There is the red parts, which is what we call the quantitative sources of growth. And there are the green parts, which is what we call the qualitative sources of growth. That's the somewhat different technology, uh, uh, terminology than we economists are used for. Um, the, the red parts, of course, is labor quantity, which is basically the number of the growth in the number of hours worked contributing to GDP growth. The light red part is what we call capital quantity. That's basically the investment in regular machinery, equipment, and structures. That's sort of you know, what any economy does, okay? So the, those are the regular things. Adding more people, adding more machines and structures is giving you a lot of growth. And frankly, in most of the times, so explaining most of the growth. <coughs> the interesting stuff is, of course, the free qualitative parts. 
The, the, the light green part is the lightest green part is capital quality, which is, is essentially the digital transformation because it is the larger share of information and communication technology assets into the total investment portfolio. So the more we shift from regular machinery and equipment and buildings to these ICT or information and communication technology assets, that is reflected in this capital quality growth. The middle green part is labor quality, and that is basically the shift towards workers with higher skills, with, in this case, in growth accounting, most of the time, higher levels of educational attainment. Okay? So basically, if we have more people in the if we add more people in the labor force with higher educational attainments, that is labor quality. And then the residual, because it is a residual of growth, is TFP or total factor productivity. Again, for those of you who are not experts, I will use that term a little more. And that is basically the spillover. It is the bonus that an economy can get from optimally combining these quantitative and qualitative sources of growth. Again, for the economists, sorry for spending a little bit of time on it, but I think because I'm using it a couple of times, it's important that we get that straight. So when you look on the left-hand side, and certainly when you look at the last five years or so, you can immediately see some interesting things happening. We already know that the UK had an employment miracle, so the, 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 the employment growth, the dark red part, the hours growth, has been very high, also even relative to the investment growth, the capital uh, quantity growth. But the real issue is that the uh, green part, the <coughs> quality growth of labour and capital, uh, has been very low, and total factor productivity simply isn't there in the last five years, according to those measures. The right hand side you see the same thing but now it is in terms of contributions to labor productivity growth. So you don't see the employment anymore because that's in the denominator of the equation. But of course the TFP growth is the same. So recently again well known fact but very much supported by the numbers is that UK has been driven by, uh, growth has been driven by employment increases. But the real issue is to slow down in qualitative uh, sources of growth. How does that compare to other countries? So here I just added the United States, Germany and the Netherlands. And you can see, of course, we have all had a slowdown. Go back to my earlier point, this is not just a UK phenomenon, but the problem in the UK simply is larger, right? This is contributions to labor productivity growth. So you don't see the employment bit here, but you can see in the UK the last five years, it was only half a percent productivity growth. That's about half of what it was in the US. And it is just a little bit lower than, uh, than it was in uh, Germany and in the Netherlands. But again, the slowdown, because of the relatively successful earlier periods in 1996 to 2007, has been quite substantive. Here you can see how successful uh, the UK, originally had been the UK's 100 here, how uh, successful the UK has been in creating stronger TFP growth rates, but how, since the mid-2000s, basically the TFP gap has significantly widened. And when you look at the, uh, the lines here, you can see that actually the gap in terms of UK, uh, actually the UK is the purple line, sorry, the US is 100, I said that wrong. US is 100, so you can see the purple line narrowing until 2005, but then opening again since 2005, and today the TFP levels in the UK are actually lower compared to Germany and the US than they were in 2000, and then they were in 1995. So we have widened the gap. Now, we can debate what this exactly means, TFP levels, and I'm sure some of you may have questions around that when we, when we have time. But I do think it is an important uh, uh, topic to make because this is where a lot of the digital transformation comes in, right? I mean, you would want to see total factor productivity benefit from digital transformation. It's a technology and innovation, and you want it to create spillovers from the investments you are making in the economy, and that apparently isn't so visible uh, from these kind of numbers. Okay, so this is a good point to transfer to the issue of the new digital economy and the new productivity paradox. And basically what I've done in this chart is to basically talk about, okay, if we have a new digital economy, what is then the old digital economy, and what is making it so hard to transition? So the old digital economy is basically what happened in sort of the, the, since the 90s, 80s and 90s, mid 80s to mid 2000s. It's basically the rise of the PC, the beginnings of the internet, and those were really good drivers for businesses to become more efficient, uh, to provide individuals uh, access to digitization and to e-commerce, the beginning of e-commerce. Now at that time, many of you were around at that time, uh, you know, it felt like it was hard, but I think if you compare it with the new digital economy, it wasn't really as hard. It was basically, I'm, I'm exaggerating this a little, but it was basically we were moving from, you know, the regular calculation machine to computers and spreadsheets and PCs and we could do it on our desk. That was great 
to do, but it didn't fundamentally change the work we did. It actually made things a lot more productive because we could do things faster. And you know, here at the National Institute, we could do multiple calculations and it would move much faster than was the case in the past. The new digital economy, which really is driven by a combination of mobile technology, of ubiquitous access to the internet, uh, of the shift towards cloud and more recently to artificial intelligence and robotics, you don't have to look very far to see how fundamentally that is changing business models. Companies have to reinvent how they, what they produce, if they're a service company, how they interact with the consumer, and how they're organizing themselves in order to get that done. And I think the evidence that is appearing is that in contrast to the thinking that every phase, every new technology, that's why I was showing these general purpose technologies at the bottom, every new general purpose technology will move faster and diffuse faster and be faster absorbed, I think it's just wrong. I think it is true that it's diffusing faster, certainly in a digital economy, but the absorption is not necessarily faster than it has been in previous times. So originally people said it may take 10 years, well it may make 20 years and some of these technologies may perhaps never make it. So that is I think a very important part of the story here. We did a study in 2016 at the conference board, this is a business oriented study, so it's very, very focused on what the implications are for, for businesses. What do they differently in the new economy? And, and I will discuss some of those things in a little bit more detail. First of all, businesses are moving away from buying IT assets, computers, hardware, to basically buying digital services. And that has an important implication for the way we measure things, but also in the way that it is creating productivity. Secondly, in doing that, they do a lot more data analytics, and as a result of that, they have a much better way of trying to get a handle on where their business opportunities are. They spend a lot more on knowledge-based or intangible assets. I will talk about that. Uh, that includes, of course, training, but also design. They're intensifying their recruitment of tech-savvy workers, and by that I do not just mean data scientists, but they basically try to recruit people across the organization who have an ability to work with these new technologies. And I will argue that some of the competencies and skills that people need in order to interact with these new technologies are quite different from what we expected in the past. They're forging new partnerships with suppliers and researchers, so the, 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 the boundaries of the firm are, are blurring. And they put a lot more emphasis on these, are these famous business terms, resiliency and agility, which I will not talk about today. I will talk about three things today. First of all, that shift from digital assets to digital services. I will talk about the uh, intangibles and I will talk uh, a little bit about um, um, what are some of the insights on skills and competencies. So to start on the first point, what we did when we did this study in 2016, I have not updated this, uh, so these data are only going to 2014, is that on the horizontal you see for Germany, for US, UK and Germany, on the horizontal you see uh, fixed assets in ICT. So this is hardware, computers, uh, software is also part of that. Um, on the left-hand side, you see computer services, which are essentially intermediate inputs. They are not assets, they are not accumulated, they are not depreciated, they detract from uh, uh, output, they are in fact not part of value added. So if you want them to contributing to productivity growth, you would have to capitalize them and you would have to make sure that they are measured in a way that you can identify whether they are creating productivity effects. Now you can see how that shift has happened over time. So from, from green to uh, yellow, in the US it happened a little earlier, probably in the early 2000s that you saw the share of hard assets in IT uh, slowing relative to GDP, but you know, the investments in digital services increase. In the UK and in Germany it was a little later, it was more like in the course of the 2000s that it was happening. So there's a pacing issue here, a time issue, but the trend is pretty much everywhere the same. This is quite often missed in the discussion, right? Quite often we see discussions where people say, oh, the investment in IT investment has come down. This must be really bad. Well, not necessarily, because if that has been a shift from IT assets to IT services, that is not necessarily bad. The question is, are these IT assets, these IT services in combination with other productive resources, curating productivity growth or not? That's a big question, well, to which uh, we're still trying to figure out uh, the answer. What we did find when we look at this across industries, I'm, I'm <coughs> going to cut through some of these charts fairly quickly now, but basically all the industries that are below uh, the line here are the ones that are showing this change 
towards uh, IT services as a percentage of output faster than the change in IT assets relative to output. Okay? So you see this is a pretty widespread phenomenon. This is only done for the US, uh, but we, we could do that for the UK and, and for Germany as well. The second important part is this increase in intangibles. And here I'm going to rely very heavily on uh, the work by uh, the folks who've been building the Intan Invest uh, portfolio of data, uh, Carol Corrado, John van Haskell, Cecilia Giorna Licinio, and uh, Massimiliano Oyemi, um, where they really try to now build, you know, in addition to all those tangible investments that we are including, what are the intangible investments of which data services are part but what else is there in terms of intangibles that we need to take care of? So there's computer software and databases, that's part of IT services, at least the databases is. Then there's a whole group of about four things that are sort of uh, gray blackish here. This is innovative property, so this is uh, uh, entertainment and originals, uh, uh, literary originals, design, new product development, R&D of course very importantly, which is the black part here. And then there's this large group that's called economic competencies, that includes stuff like brands, organizational capital, and training. This is stuff that business executives get very excited about when I show them this because they say that's exactly right. That's where we spend our money on when we, when we need to make digital technology work is indeed on these uh, economic competencies that are here at the end. Again, when I'm comparing the four countries here that I identified earlier, you can see everybody has been increasing that share. The US very rapidly, Germany much slower, the UK originally quite rapidly from 1995 to 2007, but since 2005, but since then stayed at about the same level as it was, as, as it was before. Also the Netherlands has been increasing. Now there have been lots of explanations why this is and what is causing this. A lot of this has to do with digital transformation. A lot of this is happening in the services sector of the economy, which is why it is perhaps not a surprise that particularly the US and the UK, which are very ser strongly services oriented uh, countries, uh, have been spending so much more, whereas Germany, which is more of a manufacturing uh, economy, has been spending a little bit less on these economic competencies, although it's spent quite significantly and much more than anyone else on research and development, which is, is the black line here. So it's a reflection of different structures in the economy. But the growth has been everywhere uh, very visible uh, since the 2000s. Uh, again, it's interesting when I take these two things, IT services and intangibles, they're pretty strongly related. So again, we looked at uh, industry levels in uh, industry studies in the United States. And you see that where, there where we see increases in IT services intensity, we see increases in intangibles. And again, uh, the authors have done a fair amount of work in terms of finding correlations between those two and explanations for those two. The question, of course, is does this help to resolve the productivity issue? And when you look at the data, <laughs> not really. Uh, so we have made these investments in intangibles. The intangible capital deepening here, which is a contribution to labor productivity growth, is the blue part. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite, it's large. It was larger perhaps even in 2000, 2007, although the authors uh, would argue that actually it has stayed on pretty well since the uh, financial crisis. But when we look at the dark green part, which is the TFP growth plus the labor quality, that put that together in their study, it's been slowing. Now, this is not a causal study, you know, we need to do a lot more work. I think there's more mileage to be made, but at least for the moment, the strawman is that somehow these investment in intangibles have not yet created that total factor productivity growth that we, that we would like to see, because that has actually slowed pretty much everywhere uh, in, in this study. So the next thing we then did is said, well, let's move from this macro level and look a little bit more at what is happening at sector level. And of course, there's many industries and how do you present this? And also the data are quite imperfect in this respect. So what we did is that we basically developed a taxonomy, which was partly based on a taxonomy we had done earlier. And then there's been recent work in the OECD, which basically is looking at um, which share of industries, uh, sort of the 50% above median part of industries that are uh, the most intensive users of digital technology versus the 50% of industries that are the least intensive users of digital technology. And I have to go through a little bit here to make sure that I'm telling you what sort of goes into this taxonomy. One of the things that went into that indeed is the share of, of IT services is the share of uh, IT intangi uh, of intangibles, IT tangible and, and other intangibles, 
but also this is based on the stock of robots, this is based on the share of IT specialists, it's based on the share of turnover from online sales. OCD pulled that all together, developed four categories in the middle, but to make it a little bit simpler, also given the limited data availability, we decided in the end to basically identify three groups. The blue group is the low intensive users of digital technology, the purple is the um, uh, the most digital users of, of uh, most, uh, most intensive users of digital technology. And then we had the red ones, which are the producers of digital technology. It's important to keep those separate because they have a very different performance, as I will show in a minute, than these other two groups. Of course, that red group is relatively small, but quite important uh, in terms of their contributions to productivity growth. And the others are essentially 50-50. Okay, so you'll see some of those, so, so what's interesting here, the ones that are the most digital uh, 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 users, of course including at the top there printing and media, there's the whole machinery transport equipment uh, type industry, but a fair amount of services, retail, wholesale trade, finance, uh, professional services, public administration and defense, interestingly, uh, has been in the, in the top group. Uh, professional services, I mentioned arts and entertainment and other services. So a lot of services, actually the majority of services is included in the most digital intensive using uh, categories. So we then did an audit decomposition and we said, okay, if we have those three categories, IT producing, intensive users and less intensive users, how do they actually contribute to labor productivity growth? So we looked at uh, the period 1996-2006, then we looked at 2007 to 2017, but that of course includes the crisis, so we, we take at the last bar is a, is a sub-period, this 2013 to 2017, to get a little bit more focused. And what you see here is quite interesting. I want to start with the US for a moment, because the US is actually the most shocking here. Because what you see in the US, first of all, the red part, which is the digital producers, which accounts for about 10% of, well, less, 8% of US GDP and significantly less in terms of US employment, but they contributed for, you know, a very significant part of productivity growth. And in the last decade, they actually, if I take the whole decade, they accounted for half of labor productivity growth in the United States. And in the last uh, four years, actually digital producers, so that relatively small sector of the economy, accounted for the bulk of productivity growth in the US. This is a result that we didn't only find, Susan Hausman, who's worked on this, found exactly the same result. The US productivity miracle, if there's anything like that, is completely gone. It's completely concentrated in digital uh, producers. And interestingly, the digital users, the green part, has become very, very small. So it's highly, highly concentrated and across the US economy we see weak productivity growth. Even more so than, for example, in the US, uh, than in the UK, sorry which is the first part. In the UK, it's actually interesting what we find. Yes, there has been a slowdown in productivity growth, but there has been a bit of a pickup in the last four years. And interestingly, the digital, intensive digital users actually contribute to the largest bulk, in contrast to what has been happening in some of the other countries. So that also saw it, the Netherlands and Germany, but in the UK, it's been most explicit. So here's the good news, I think, at least that's what these data suggest that you may not have a lot of productivity growth in the UK, but where you have it is where you would expect it. That is where we actually have intensive digital users. That's good news, right? So there could be two things. One is that Rebecca has done, and her colleagues have done a terrific job, and you are measuring it right, and everybody else is measuring it wrong. And I'm, I'm kidding a little bit, but there might be some truth to that, because there's a lot of work done here in, in the UK, together with ONS, to actually improve these measures. So maybe we are picking it up, and nobody else is really picking up. So, <laughs> here's my title, we may be simply missing it in other countries. That might be a reason. The other reason is perhaps that the UK environment is actually good in terms of making sure that it allocates resources there where you can get some productivity growth. You want more, for sure, and we have to discuss why you can get more, but maybe it's happening in the right place. Now, this is provocative, this may be wrong, I'm sure that some of you will try to argue at this point, uh, not be the case, but I do find that as a, a very interesting uh, contrast between the UK and the US, whereas in the past, UK productivity trends tended to follow the US much more closely. That's not what we have been seeing in the last couple of years. Here you see it actually reflected again uh, in a somewhat different way here. Now the most digital intensive sectors, this is just the UK on the left-hand side of this chart. The least intensive digitals are on the right-hand uh, side of this chart. 
Uh, but again, you can see that the TFP growth, which in this case is the blue, is actually better with the most digital intensive users than it is with the less intensive. It's not great, these are low numbers, let's be clear about that, but at least it seems to be happening in, in the right place. Again, this is a sick price lecture, so I do want to spend some time on, on the importance of skills and competencies. And there's been a lot of work around this, uh, all the research that SICK and his team has done, but all the follow-up research that has been done at the National Institute and at other places has identified that, okay, these high university degrees are not necessarily making the difference here. It is a lot is about intermediate qualifications and is about uh, vocational skills. If I translate that to today's digital transformation world, it simply means that it is not all about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, but it is around a lot of other competencies that you need in jobs. And there's a lot of progress made in research, both on the economic side, but also in business research, which I get somewhat involved with, given my, my conference board link, that the competencies that we're talking about is what is changing. And there's all this discussion about occupations disappearing, and yes, there are occupations disappearing, that happened in every previous technology. Uh, we don't have many horse riders any longer. Uh, we have now more people driving cars and trucks. These things will happen again. But the big issue is the actual skills and competencies that people need to have in order to make these technologies successful. So what we have done is that this is US work because we've been looking in the US to have access to a database that's called ONET. It's a, a database published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics that basically for 700 occupations identifies the key competencies, about 200 competencies that are allocated to 700 occupations, incredibly rich database, and I update it uh, occasionally. What we've then done, I'll, I'll be short on this, but we basically try to identify in the base of business studies and, and, and case studies that we've done ourselves at the conference <coughs> board, what are the competencies that are important for digital transformation. We then did a whole bunch of factor analysis to reduce those 200 competencies to 12 critical competencies that, uh, that are important uh, uh, as part of digital transformation. So including to STEM, this is adaptability and flexibility, autonomy, empowerment, decision making, corporate teams and uh, group interaction, great creativity, mistake handling. I really need to think about SICK here because he talked a lot about that, mistake handling, learning culture, conflict handling, enterprising, dealing with external customers. Some of this is technology, some of it is management, but a lot of it is just very good social skills. And some of these skills you can learn at school, some of them you learn in cooperative teams and in organizations, but they are the critical ones that really help drive uh, digital transformation. So we call this, we developed something that we call the Innovation Potential of Occupations dashboard. And what we then did is we said, well, let's take, uh, well, before we do that, and then we looked at some occupations, and you can see that, you know, <laughs> these kind of competencies are across various occupations. So let's start with uh, physicists, which is clearly a STEM kind of occupation. And when you look at STEM, they are absolutely scoring on the top here. They're scoring on the top when it comes to creativity and to learning. But, you know, they're not great in inclusive decision making. Physicists, for example, <laughs> right? Uh, they are not great entrepreneurs. So there's a few exceptions taken there. They're not great in handling conflicts. I don't know about that, but that's what these results suggest. But then there are some other not so much innovative occupations in terms of the way that we think about it, like human resources managers and marketing managers, but they seem to be much better in handling conflicts. Uh, sales managers are good in risk tolerance, uh, in adaptability and flexibility. So you can see how these cores are differing. We then applied it across uh, 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 industries. So the occupations were allocated to industries. And then you can see which industries do actually have the highest number of um, people with uh, those kind of competencies that are relevant and important for digital transformation. And you can see again, if you just go down the line, and real estate is at the top, but you know, then you've got uh, telecommunications there, finance, publishing, uh, IT and information services, public administration, education, I'm still talking about services, right? Uh, health and social work. Now, uh, finally, I'm with electrical and optical equipment. That's manufacturing. And of course, there are a few more down the road. So heavily, heavily concentrated in services activities of the economy. That's basically what this, what this work is doing. We're still working on this. This is relatively new work. So again, this is not a causal exercise. But we basically said, well, let's look at productivity growth. And let's put them in quadrants. And let's see which most which occupations are sitting at this end 
where we have increases in labor productivity growth and where we have the highest changes in innovation potential of competencies over time. And you can see, well you can't see it but you can read it, that almost half of the industries in the top right quadrant uh, are sitting in the right quadrant, if you like, and 55% of the hours worked are sitting in that space. So there is, there is a suggested, a straw man again for doing more research about the relation between these innovation competencies and the change in labor productivity. I really think that's another research area. Okay, where are we right now? Just a quick summary. Globally, productivity growth has dropped off. There's a lot of weakness, in particular in total factor productivity growth. There's no single explanation, but digital transformation, in my view, is a critical part of this, of this story. The UK has weakened, uh, again, over the last uh, 10 years, uh, but it has done relatively well in the digital intensive using industries. Uh, and it has an advantage in intangible investment, but it has not translated itself in TFP spillovers, at least that's not what the data suggests. And the skills and competencies are very broad based and, and really uh, require an, a very diverse underlying digital investment strategy. Okay, let me wrap up with one or two comments about the future. Never make too many comments about the future because you're always proven to be wrong. So what might bring about that productivity recovery and what is it that could possibly uh, make us uh, miss a productivity recovery again. So I made this point before. Uh, this is just looking at quarterly productivity uh, numbers. Uh, yes, there's the blue line is the US is a little bit, it's at least a stabilizing at reasonable levels right now, but the UK is still coming down, which is the orange line here. So it's really, it's really hard to, to make a big point for the fact that we're already seeing it and just not, not, not looking very carefully. This chart is a back of the envelope <laughs> exercise, but sometimes these are useful <laughs> things to do. What we did here is that we basically looked at the last three periods, which are on the left hand side, and we basically decomposed GDP growth into the growth of hours worked and the growth of labor productivity. Very simple. And then we said, okay, let's just do a few mind exercises. If we would have the same productivity growth over the next 10 years, as we had over the last five years, which is what you see in comparing the last two comps, last six years, we have a much slower growth of hours growth because we know that, that hours growth will slow down because of aging populations and rapid retirement and fewer people being added to the workforce. If that would all happen, we would end up with labor productivity growth at about 0.7%. That's quite, quite low. If we want to come back to the growth rate of the last six years, which wasn't great, but was okay, right? Well, you know, sort of, you know, 1.7, 1.8%, we would have to grow productivity by an other 1.2%, 1.7% labor productivity growth. That's, it's not impossible, but that's pretty much, that's a lot. If we would want to go back to the growth rate of 1996, 2007, we may not want to go, have to go back there, but if we want to, which is what some people would wish, we would have to grow labor productivity by 2.7% and that would be a total order. I can do the same exercise for the US, I actually did it, similar kind of numbers. Point really being, whatever we do, even if we are successful in reviving productivity growth, we're not going to go back to the growth rates of the 1990s, early 2000s, it's just not possible. <coughs> we might be able to stabilize growth at the growth rates that have been happening in the last six years. And maybe that's good enough. We have slower population growth and maybe in terms of crop to income, we're okay with that. But there are many other questions about it. Do we have enough resources for investment in healthcare and sustainability and all those kinds of questions. Okay, here is the tricky bit. So we did these projections forward. Our growth projections are based on these kind of numbers. Uh, we've shown early the growth compositions for these earlier two periods. And then we have an underlying model, which I'm not going to bore you with right now, although I'm happy again to discuss. But what we see in the case of the UK is of course this slow growth of labor quantity. Capital quantity is staying up at relatively high levels, actually concerning because the question is how much can you grow capital quantity if your labor growth is so slow? It just means that your capital labor ratios are going to go up very rapidly. That's kind of tough to do. But the qualitative sources of growth are really, according to these projections models, to be really weak. Now, this is a projection. This is not a forecast. This is based on, you know, some interesting exercise if we do with modeling. But the way that I would present this always to audiences is, this is sort of what might happen if we're not going to do anything, right? Because that's it's, it's highly, highly based on what we've done in the past. We made some projections forward. But really, this is what we're facing if in case we're going forward. Well, the good news is we're not falling off the cliff. But the question is, is that sort of qualitative growth share in the total growth, is that going to be sufficient 
or is that going to create all sorts of issues? That's the issue for discussion. And again, you can see that in some other countries, we're actually doing better. The UK really has an issue here uh, in terms of exaggerating this. So, so the, the challenge for the UK is in that sen in sense larger than it is for some of the other countries. Okay, final slide, some observations here. No silver bullet for productivity growth. N digital transformation also is not the solution. It's one of the critical solutions and I wanted to spend some time on that because I think it's a very important one. I do think that the slow uh, transition to the new digital economy, the limited effectiveness of intangible investment really requires a focus on innovation and knowledge-based strategies. Um, I do think that a broad-based diversified education and training strategy that really takes account of these competencies which really are trained in intermediate and, and vocational skills is quite important. And my final comment, the final three things are based actually on a parallel discussion in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm involved in a discussion in the Netherlands that I want to spend 50 billion uh, euros on strengthening the structure of the, uh, of the <laughs> Dutch economy. And again, I invited a bunch of economists to say, tell us what to do, particularly tell us also what not to do. Uh, so, and we're pretty good in telling people what not to do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so a, a few things came out there, but I think the three things that I really thought were very important, this is really needs a long-term strategy. And that's important, that, you know, that's a no-brainer, but how often do we change our policies? Because we don't think they have generated the effects in two or three years' time, whereas some of these things really take much longer. So uh, that's, it's a systemic change that these new technologies are making, and they're not going to change overnight. So a lot of discussion about so-called going back to the mission-oriented technology. So we have these big questions today about climate and about aging populations and things like that. And they do need massive investments. But the risk, of course, is that we are forgetting about the need to diffuse those technologies so that we really can spread it regionally across firms, uh, across firm sizes, and so on and so forth. So we think com combining mission and diffusion is interesting. And finally, we can talk about productivity forever but it's going to be, it has to be about jobs, because otherwise you won't even get the societal, let alone the political support for this. Now, what good jobs are, I put it between hyphens, we can have a whole discussion around it, some people do, but it really has to be productivity that is taken from a perspective of creating better jobs going forward. Um, so, no silver bullet, no final solution, but I hope to have contributed a little bit to the debate around productivity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I work at the Brazilian Embassy at the economic session. Uh, I thank you for the very um, sophisticated analysis of the productivity issue. Uh, I, I w wanted to hear your opinion on uh, other less sophisticated hypotheses. For instance, uh, some people say that there is actually a problem of measurement when we talk of uh, a very service-oriented economy like the UK. And also another hypothesis would be that migration from the uh, EU would reduce the pressure to uh, businesses to invest in labor-saving technologies. Mm -hmm. So just to see how do you think they, <laughs> these are relevant or not. Well, it's interesting how you position it. I. I agree that some of this is sophisticated, but when it comes to measurement of productivity, you talk about real sophistication, <laughs> so, uh, so which is one reason probably why I avoided it. But as I mentioned, measurement problems are critical, and at an extreme uh, view, there is the view that we may, and I mentioned this, that we may be missing part of this productivity recovery because we're not measuring it very well. I think what the literature is showing here, and again, this is ongoing, and there are people in the room who know a lot more about it than I do, as long as we work within the framework of our definition of what economic growth and GDP and everything else is, there are measurement problems, but we can largely deal with them, right? We talk about better measurement of the changes in quality of some of these inputs, and I talked about the move from IT assets to IT services, and we need to, to measure this better. We need to think about the, the, the declining prices of new technologies that are being uh, implemented. Uh, these, in a way, have been issues of all times, and once we get them uh, sort it out, we may actually see somewhat faster growth. The bigger issues around digital technology are, of course, there's a lot of free content here. There's a lot of additions to 
uh, uh, welfare that are not measured as part of our GDP, and that's why there are initiatives now to measure other concepts of welfare uh, and wealth than um, taking a measure of GDP. The question is, what do you include? What do you not include? And sometimes broadening these measures doesn't always mean that it is, you know, that, that welfare is going up faster than GDP is rather than slower. So in a nutshell, that's the answer that I would have to that question, but it, it's, it's very, very important. Uh, but I do think that at least within the framework of the national accounts, we are in the right ballpark. Uh, I do not believe, for example, that the slowdown that we have been seeing in the last 10 years can be explained away by measurement issues. I think everything that we have been seeing has probably actually you know, uh, made it even clearer where the measurement issues uh, and where the decline is actually happening. <coughs> on migration, look, it's really, it really depends on how it changes the composition of the workforce. Um, if, if migration really means that it is primarily focused on uh, immigration of people with lower skills that would be pushing out people with potentially higher skills in the labor market, that, that hypothesis would be right. But some of the competencies that are immigrating into the country may actually competencies that we don't have in the UK or in the Netherlands or in any, any other economy that is happening. So it's a very subtle story. And again, the impact of migration on productivity is a topic of great interest, but still with little clear-cut evidence that it's going one way or the other. So again, sophisticated research is probably what we need. Um, Matthew Dixon from Scope at Oxford. I like two things in particular from your presentation. First of all, this distinction between diffusion and what you might call digesting. Uh, uh, really, really important. And I guess that tells us something because presumably the techies can tell you about what's out there but what you do to change your business model has to come from others. Um, and in terms of your wonderful chart of the different skills required, um, every single employer survey that I'm aware of for several decades in this country has talked about the need for more soft skills. And what do we do? We worry about STEM graduates. So I think it is, it is a really big issue, and I think it does relate to that distinction you make. So first of all, on the change of business models, um, businesses really struggle to, to get this right, um, to, to, to build collaborative cultures, uh, which really, and, and to build an agile workforce that is moving <laughs> from, multiple, from one project to another, to not think in terms of departments, but in term, think in terms of projects that companies are working on. I mean, it's extremely difficult uh, to do it. And, and to, the, to the other point that you're making related to this, I agree with you, every survey we do is saying exactly the same thing. The same question at the same time, is management, is management then really walking the talk in way of making it happen in a way they're actually working together as a management team, right? And there sometimes you don't see the kind of collaboration that they are actually expecting from their staff to happen at lower levels in the organization. So it's really an organizational commitment. It's also a leadership commitment that is missing in a lot of organizations. Absolutely. And I don't know whether the UK is worse than others at that, but it's certainly an issue. The other point I'd make is that it's, it's not necessarily a level issue. Um, it's not that we need more intermediate skills, that we need those skills for everyone. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. By intermediate skills, I don't need it for the intermediate the category of people with intermediate qualifications. If intermediate skills is those are not necessarily academic skills or purely manual skills. They are absolutely right. much too much on the academic level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, James Smith Resolution Foundation. Uh, echo others um, saying this has been a really interesting talk. Um, absolutely fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask you about something you mentioned early on in your talk, which is um, that the productivity slowdown predated the crisis. Um, I particularly wanted to ask what what the evidence is for that, particularly outside the US, um, because even in your chart, it wasn't completely obvious that, that what was, that's what was going on. And certainly John Fernald has said a lot about um, and made a convincing case that in the US it predated. But this is a key reason why people say um, some of the slowdown in productivity is structural, because it wasn't anything to do with the crisis was already happening. But I wasn't sure, particularly for the UK, whether that was in the data. Yeah, I don't have the annual UK figures in my head, so I apologize that I can't date it exactly. What I do know for the European Union, for example, that's been the case. I know for the Netherlands, it's always sort of these two 
2425. In Germany it was a little later because they had the cyclical upswing in 2006-7 and productivity is post-cyclical. So there it took into sort of almost 2008 before it came down. So it's a little bit business cycle related. But I think the critical point that Vernald made and I think is confirmed in most of the studies that this, this slowdown in productivity is basically because this all digital economy was running a little bit out of steam in terms of it needed to move to a next level of, of, uh, of applications. This is the new digital economy. You have to be a little bit careful here because, you know, uh, in a way I don't think the old digital economy and the new digital economy are completely two different general purpose technologies that are obviously very related. Um, but the point that I wanted to make is the way that it is changing businesses and business models has been dramatically different. And I think that the mileage by by the early 2000s was basically run when it came to applications in retail, for example, and wholesale, where this was big, and transportation, and when these new digital technologies came around uh, to do this. But again, as I said, the crisis obviously hasn't helped because then, you know, investment came to a halt and demand came to a halt. So, you know, the incentive for companies to really drive much faster on this was gone for almost a decade. So. Thank you. In a couple of articles written almost 65 years ago, my father adapted the Markov chain to predict the probability of a family's transition from one socioeconomic group to another. He outlined a number of theoretical transition patterns, including a completely rigid society in which, as he's put it, all sons would have to go into the social class of their father. And then the perfectly mobile society at a, an extreme in which the chance of being in any social class does not depend on the social class of one's father. My father was passionate, kind and optimistic, but his dispassionate approach to this particular matter of whether the next generation maintains, improves or worsens the circumstances of its predecessor reassures me greatly as I and my siblings grapple with the challenge of even coming close to the achievements of our father. A medieval commentator on the biblical verse in Deuteronomy elaborates that the injunction to teach your children an injunction that, as a religious Jew, my father recited thrice daily as part of his prayers, should be understood, says the medieval commentator, as an obligation to instruct, well, your students. My father's legacy is far more the property of his colleagues, his students and the subsequent generations of economists than it is of his biological descendants. It is in this context a huge pleasure for us that the Institute, where my father worked for close on 60 years, has kindly chosen to arrange and host this annual lecture in memory of my father, focusing on one of the areas they dedicated much time to, namely economic productivity. We have in fact arranged a medal to be presented to our annual speaker, which this year is Professor Van Ark, and I think it even has your name on it. Wow. So, oh, that's, that's fantastic. I think it's... Yeah. Can I take it? Shows the medal. Yep. Here it is. I will show to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And so again, I and my family express our huge gratitude to the Institute and to Professor Van Ark for enabling this event to happen this evening. Thank you. Thank you.